welcome to making sense of it all. I want you in this presentation to put yourself in the place of God and we're going to start by reading what he said and what he thought. So we're going to turn to John chapter 3 verse 16 and this verse says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Adam and Eve had been told that if they disobeyed, they would perish. And God is saying here that he so loved our world, and that means you and me, he so loved us that he doesn't want us to have to perish. So he's given us an option. He has sent Jesus into our world so that Jesus can show us how to live. Jesus can open the door and Jesus has opened that door for us. Let me read verse 17. It's the following on verse and it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, so that we can have a new opportunity and a new chance of living. So this is our God. So now, let's take our place in imagination, if you like. We're going to a high place to look down on this world, and we're going to see it from God's point of view, a God's eye view, if you like. And God can see this hell hole down here. He can see where we are all hostages. And I wonder if you've ever thought about it. Jesus sees the people who were made in his image. He sees disability. He sees people who can't see, people who can't hear. He hears fighting and squabbling and wars and gunfire, crying, weeping. Can you imagine it? But not just that. He hears loud music and laughter and a loud beat in the world. Everywhere it seems as if the noise is trying to drown out the sorrow of the world. Christ must weep as he hears it, because inside that hell hole it's dark. There is the most awful atmosphere in there. There is no love, just hatred. The Lord says in the Bible, what more could I have done? You see, the door to that prison stands open. Can you really imagine a prison with its door open and people refuse to come out of their cells? They refuse to walk free and run out into the sunshine and the blue sky? It just doesn't seem possible, does it? And yet this is what it looks like to God. For years and years and years, he has been calling to people. He's been saying, come unto me, come. Just occasionally, somebody will put their head out through the prison door and they'll say, I don't believe in God. Another one will put their head through the door and say, there is no God. They don't realize that the door is open for them to walk free. They're happy to put their head out and deny there's a God, but it's God that's opened that door and they refuse. This must make God so, so sad. What more could he have done? God made us. God took our punishment. God himself, because one of his commandments had been broken. It was his law. And he took the punishment for that law. That's so hard to imagine, but that's true. And then people sneer and they say, I'm so strong. I don't need a crutch. I don't have to rely on anybody else. But is their life happy? Of course it isn't. Everybody in this world is searching for order, fighting despair fighting that desolation. 
Just think how many words there are, beginning with D. Discouragement, death, disease, devil. That's where it all begins. And the devil has so brainwashed people that they will not hear that invitation. They refuse. That has even happened in today's world. I want to tell you about a situation that happened in Sweden which demonstrates this perfectly. In Sweden, a bank was under attack from bank robbers. They came into the bank, they took hostage the people who were working in the bank, and even though during the course of the day help came, the police were ready to free the people within that bank, those employees refused to come out, even though they had every opportunity. This siege went on for a week. It's a very well-known, very well-documented experience. But during that time, those bank robbers took over the minds of the people in that bank. Whether they hypnotized them, but whatever it was, they had them under their spell. They had them to the point where the links became so close between the employees and the bank robbers that when it was finally all over and the prison sentences were finished, one of the employees actually married one of the bank robbers. And that is what happened between us and Satan. Satan has taken us hostage and we're listening to him. This is why people put their heads through the open door and say, God, we don't want you. Can you imagine how sorry God must feel and how sad? For me it seems unbelievable that human beings with that offer of freedom can actually be like that. But stand with our Lord again for a little bit longer outside of the open door. Suddenly, within the prison, there is a wave of jeering that can be heard. Awful taunts and sneers coming from within. And then, through the door, stumbles one hostage. That hostage is still chained. The chains clank as he walks and he is carrying a huge burden. But as he comes out, he can barely walk. He's blind. He's been in the darkness for so long. Spiritual blindness. He is almost deaf because he's refused to listen to what the Lord has said. Not only that, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's emaciated, he's miserable and wretched and poor. While he was in there, he did not know that. But he has heard the invitation and he has come out. At this point, Jesus leaves our side where we've been watching and runs to him and takes him in his arms and gathers him up and throws his arms round him in a warm, loving embrace. Immediately there is drink for him, the water of life. That water of life are the promises in the Word of God, the promises that tell us that God loves us and that he doesn't condemn us. Can you imagine what that prisoner must feel to be told that he's not condemned? And then he's given the bread of life to strengthen him, telling him that everything that he has done can be forgiven. And God really loves him so much. Once he has come out and he's refreshed with the food and the drink, then the Lord says to him, let's sit down together. We need to talk about things. And Jesus says to him, tell me, What's that heavy weight that you're carrying? What is it that you've brought out with you? And he looks at this big heavy weight that he's shackled to and he says, that's my past. Ah, do those words fill you with strange emotions? Sadness, remorse, disappointment, even fear, despair. Would you like to get rid of your past? 
because I know that so many people are carrying a past with them that they don't know what to do with it. And this is what causes so much of the mental health problems in this world. People don't know how to get rid of their past and it takes them to the point where sometimes they take their own lives while disturbed of mind, as the coroner would say. But the Lord says, tell me about your past. And then Jesus picks up a big book and he says, I know all about your past. We've got to have a debriefing session, but I can help you. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Be of good courage. And together we'll sort this out. And then Jesus says, I want you to go back as far as you can in your life and remember the very first thing that you can remember ever doing wrong. Shall I tell you what it was that I did wrong? The first thing that I can remember. My mother had a crocus growing in the lawn, just one, a purple crocus. And she'd said to me, look, isn't that pretty? She said, but I don't want you to pick it. She knew that I liked picking flowers. She said, just leave it there so we can all enjoy it. It was a house that we just moved into. So she hadn't planted it. It was a lovely surprise for all of us. And of course, what did I do? I went and picked that crocus. I remember holding it in my hand. And I remember wondering, what do I do now? I've been told not to pick that crocus, but I had. And then I tried with my tiny little fingers. I must have been about four or five, I think. And I tried to dig a hole to bury that crocus flower. I remember pressing down the soil and thinking, now that spoilt the flower completely. Over lunchtime, my mother looked out of the window and she said, oh, where's my crocus gone? And she looked at me. Well, we both knew where the crocus had gone and I had to admit what I'd done. It's not a good experience. And God's saying, go right back to the beginning because there may be things, even in your childhood, that you've not put right. And there's somebody that's going to help you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit into your life because this is the Holy Spirit's job to do this. That's why I've sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And the Holy Spirit will point out to you all the things that you've done through your life. And there may be a lot of them, so we're not going to hurry through this debriefing. But every time he shows you something, I want you to hold up your hands and say, yes, that's me. I did it. Lord, I'm sorry. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I heard my conscience talking to me. And every time you do that and admit it and confess it to God, then Jesus says to you, now you must turn away from that. If you were, or if you had the opportunity a second time to do it, would you do it again? Or would you make the choice not to do it? That's the decision that you've got to make. And one by one, right through your life, I want this to happen. And so it can be a long process and it can be a very painful process. I know because I've done it, but it's the best possible thing you can do because all the way through you are not being condemned for it. However bad you've been, however awful the thing that you've done, you're not being condemned for it. David in the Bible was a deliberate adulterer, a deliberate murderer, and yet he was loved of God. God can take you back in just the same way as that. It's so good. And then when you've come to the end of everything, it may take a long time, you may have one or two things that you don't know how to put right. And it might be that there are things that you did but the person has now died or moved away. What I suggest you do is what I did. It's just an idea. Write a letter to that person. 
admitting to that person what you've done wrong. And then keep that letter somewhere safe for a day or two, just to make sure that you really mean it and what you've told God is the absolute truth about it. Put every single detail down. What you thought, what the expression on your face was like when you said or did it. Write everything down. Then finally, when it's all there and you can say to the Lord, I really am sorry. I wouldn't do it again. I couldn't do that to that person again. When you've done that, then you can put a match to that paper and you can send it up in ashes. It can be gone. The flames and the smoke can take it away forever. And just in the same way, Jesus will go right through your book in this debriefing session because in heaven there is a record book for each one of us, a book of everything we've done, and he will write, pardon over everything that you've admitted, everything that you've acknowledged, everything you've said sorry for, and everything you've confessed. Then there will be pardon across it. But there is just one more thing Jesus tells that hostage. He says, now I want you to go to the people that you've hurt and confess to them what you've done. This is harder. This is the hardest bit of all. And I've done it, I know. But the wonderful promise in the Bible is that Jesus said, I'll go with you. I'll give you the words to say. I'll help you. Maybe you've stolen something from somebody. Then you must give back what you've taken. Maybe you have spoken untruthfully about somebody, then you have to put that right as well. If it's been personal, it has to be personal. If you've said something publicly, then you must say sorry publicly as well. But I would say that if there is something that you've done that cannot be put right, in a relationship situation, for instance, maybe these things are better between you and God because none of us can turn the clock back and that may only lead to further complications. But with personal things that you have done wrong, you'll know the kind of things I mean and God will show you, then do what he's asking you to do. When he's done that, those chains that we've heard clanking all the way through here, the Lord will take a big cutter and he will cut that chain. He will cut the heavy weight and you are free, really free. Now the sunshine that we've talked about will seem bright. Now the sky will seem a really deep blue. Jesus said, now you are whole. You are recovered. Your mind and your health, your eyes will be bright. You will look at life quite differently and people will see that you've been with Jesus. You might have heard of baptism. The next stage Jesus will take you to is to ask you to be baptised. To be baptised in water. It's only a symbol of what's happened, but it's a public demonstration. And that demonstration of being baptised in water shows people that you have died to the past, that you are now going to go under the water, and when you go under the water, you shut your eyes, you stop breathing, you stop walking. And that is to show that you have died to all your past life. It's gone from you. It's washed away. And it's a lovely demonstration for everybody else because it spurs other people on to the same experience and helps them. And then, as the person who's baptising you brings you up out of the water again, what do you do? Your eyes open and your face opens in the 
biggest smile and you start walking up out of the water, you can have a new life. Do you see what's happened? You've left the hell hole behind. You've actually cleared all the road behind you. There's no litter on your road now. Your book in heaven is totally clean. And from that moment, everything about you can be white and clean and pure and holy. But you are only a baby. Making sense of it all will carry on with the next stage because now you have to learn to live. There are very few people have a deathbed baptism and living it is half the secret. But now you know where the problems come from. The problems started with the devil. You made a connection with the devil, not a good connection, and it got you into a lot of problems. But Jesus loved you. Jesus took your punishment. Jesus covered all your past life in his book. In his book now, if anybody was to look at it, all they would see would be a picture of Jesus for the past. And now he's going to teach you how to become like Jesus. This is how to make sense of this world. One day, evil is going to be done away with. Whose side are you going to be on? Are you stuck in the Stockholm Syndrome? Or are you going to choose for the side of the one that loves you and doesn't condemn you, but can refresh your life? Come with me next time and learn some more. Went far.